Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 17. We'll be looking at verse 3 today. If you don't have a Bible, there is one provided for you in the seat pocket in front of you. John chapter 17, verse 3. The title of today's message is Knowing God. Several years back, I was in a foreign country, and uh, I was there, and and I didn't plan things well. That's that's the, sh- the short version of this. And I got to this uh, particular airport where they have picked me up before, and and I, and I thought this was uh, going to go the same way, and it didn't. And so I I got there, and there was a, a a lot of people, but I didn't know any of them. And so I'm seeing a lot of people uh, that I that I'm uh, that I, I I don't know, and there's you know hundreds of them, if not thousands of people. And uh, I don't have a phone number for the person I'm trying to contact. Uh, I, I don't see anybody that I'm supposed to go to. I don't have an address that I'm supposed to go to. And uh, as I was fully dependent on somebody be wait, waiting right there for me. And so, uh, so I'm trying not to panic and trying to think through how I'm going to get through this situation. Uh, but then eventually, and it took quite a while, uh, eventually I saw the person that I was waiting for. And they were in the parking lot. And I found them, and it was such a relief to see somebody that I knew. There was a lot of people there, but there's something important, something unique, something special about knowing somebody. To be known and to know is one of the great needs of the human heart. What I want to talk about this morning is that God wants you to know him. Now, there's a lot of reasons that people think that they can't know God. There's a lot of people who think that they've made too many mistakes. And so that means that, you know, they can't have a, a relationship with God. They can't know God. There are people who think maybe that God's too big or too busy for regular small people like us. We know that that's not true. There's some people who don't even realize that knowing God personally is an option. But God's word says otherwise. See, God is knowable, and he desires a relationship with you and I. So the main point of today's message is you can know God. So look with me in John chapter 17. We're looking at just in verse 3 this morning. And Jesus is speaking. This is in the context of his a high priestly prayer. This is a, a prayer that he prays for not just himself but for his followers. In verse 3, it says this, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. Well, I thank you for this time. Well, thank you for the music team and, and the fantastic job that they did uh, leading us in worship. What well, I thank you for Jesus and how Through his teaching, we've learned that we can know you, Father. So I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move. Lord, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So point number one, we see that we are able to know God. So knowing God is point number one. So what does it mean to know God? God, that's a fair question to ask. Uh, uh, Just because we can know God doesn't mean that we can know everything about God. God is an infinite, eternal being. So to say that we could know everything about God would not be true at all. But we can know God according to his word. And look what it says in verse 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, from whom you have sent. It says the one true God. And that's not sort of a popular statement anymore that we that somebody could say, hey, I believe that there is one true God, not a a lot of gods, and everybody just kind of does their own thing. You have to be careful that when if it's the one true God, there's people that are following uh, gods that are that are not real, that are not the one true God. False gods, you could say. You can't know those type of 
gods. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but it is absolute worst feeling in the world. Your, your friend tells you to come over, and then they give you an address, and, uh, and you knock on the door, and the people that are answering the door are not people that you know, right? You ever experienced that before? It's the, it's the absolute worst uh, feeling, and, and, uh, and, 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 and so God says uh, uh, it's important that you worship the one true God. Not, you're not going to the wrong door that you know who and what you are worshiping to be careful that it's not an invented god that we are worshiping tim keller says this if your god never disagrees with you you might be worshiping an idealized version of yourself are you listening to me church (laughs) if your god never disagrees with you you might be worshiping an idealized version of of yourself, and I think that's what a lot of people in America do. Uh, they said, "Ah, oh, this, you know, this, 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 this Bible God. I don't want anything to do with that. He's not popular with the the times, but uh, but they're not willing to give uh, uh, or get rid of a, a concept of God in their lives. And and so it just happens that everything that they do, all of their behavior, all of their actions, all of their decisions, happens to line up with the God they believe in." But that's not a God at all. That's really just you, an idealized version of yourself. So it's an invented God, not a God at all. There's a lot of people that know a lot of untrue things about God. And they hear things and say, well, I I wouldn't worship a God like that. But there's a lot of uh, bad press going on around about God. I remember uh, working uh, somewhere at a grocery store when I was younger and and uh, so my name's John, and there was another guy named John who worked there, and and uh, and so there was this uh, these girls were all upset with me in the in the grocery store, and I was like, I don't understand. I just I just started working here, and they said, Well, your name's John, and so you're this guy. You've done this, this, and this, and you do see these type of things. And I said, I'm there is a John, and I'm John, and that maybe there's another John, but I'm not him. Okay, I, I haven't done those things. You can stop being angry at me, right? It's a different uh, different person. I'm getting blamed for things that I haven't done. There's a lot of things that people believe about God that are not true. So who is this God? It's when it says in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. What does he mean by that? Well, the idea and, and, and really this sort of particular language to know is really an experiential Knowledge. It really means two things in this passage. We see it means it's experiential and it's continual. So it is an experiential knowledge. So it's not simply knowing about God. It's not simply intellectually, factually knowing about God or things about God, but knowing him personally, knowing him relationally is how God wants to uh, relate to you. The Bible says even the demons themselves believe in God, but they are most certainly not followers of God. So you can have a knowledge about God. You can know uh, about God. You can know uh, a great many things about God, but that doesn't mean that you've experienced God. There's many people that are devoutly religious that don't know God. They've done a lot of religious activity, and so they think that that means that, that, they, uh, that they know God somehow or another. And Jesus was, uh, if he was tough with anybody in the Scripture, he was tough with the religious leaders who, uh, they, they, they acknowledge God with their lips, but he said, your heart is far from me, that you have a whole lot of religious activity, but you do not know God. Uh, many of us have heard of Martin Luther, the, the great historical uh, figure the uh, reformer and uh, before he became a Christian uh, he would be in confession uh, he would say sometimes for hours and hours and hours he would be confessing his sin uh, to a priest uh, because he just felt so guilty and then he would uh, he would he would do something wrong and he'd say oh no I gotta spend more time uh, confessing and so he knew all this religious activity wasn't saving and wasn't bringing uh, his heart closer to the Lord he hadn't experienced God He had experienced religion, religious activity, but he didn't know God. Now, we are in the Grand Canyon State, and I'm not going to have anybody raise hands. If you're from Arizona and you haven't been to the Grand Canyon, 
Shame on you. Okay, that's just your own. That's just, you, found, you have your opportunity. It's, it's not that far away, okay? Uh, but I would recommend getting there even if you haven't been there uh, very long. Now, you can know a lot of things about the Grand Canyon, factually so, right? Intellectually so, you can know a lot of things about the Grand Canyon. And, and many people in our country and outside this country uh, know a lot about it. Um, you can study it in geology textbooks and say, oh, this is a, a unique pattern that is only there, and, and it's got these particular type of little critters that live there, and the Colorado uh, runs through it. And, and so you can know a lot of things about it. But it's a whole different uh, experience to go to the Grand Canyon. And you sit there as a very small person, and you're looking at the vastness of uh, this landscape, and, it, and it's all inspiring. There's nothing different about knowing intellectually about the Grand Canyon and experiencing um, this uh, magnificent uh, place on planet Earth. The same is true about God. There's a lot of people that know a lot of things about God. Maybe if you went to a, a Christian or a Catholic school, maybe you know a lot about God. But the question is, do you know God? How can you know a lot about him? God says that you can know him. So you see, first of all, this type of knowledge is experiential. It's not simply head knowledge. It is heart experience with a holy God. We see it's also continual. It's in this it's eternal life that they may know you. This is a type of verb that is in this passage. No, it's a continual process. It points to a continual personal experience. So this isn't a camp, middle school relationship where uh, by the beginning of the day you had a girlfriend and by the end of the day you do not. <laughs> right? That's, uh, uh, that, that, that can happen in, uh, and it's not a continual uh, relationship. And, 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 but, but when it comes to God, that is the case. It is an ongoing relationship that you can have with him. One of the challenges is this is in our lives, we've experienced loving relationships that have ended. There are people that have had a loving relationship with spouses and, and it ended in a, in a broken hearted divorce and it brought all sorts of, of pain. So they knew love for a while with that relationship, but then it ended. Maybe they loved a spouse and, and they lost them in, in death, as many have experienced. So many of us know love, but sometimes that love ends at least in one sense, here on earth. When I met my wife, uh, we were doing ministry. We were doing uh, church planting stuff in upstate New York. And at the time, I lived in Florida, and my wife lived in Arizona. And here I am. And, uh, and so you already know where the story's going, right? So, uh, so, uh, so we, we lived in Arizona, and, and uh, she lived in Arizona. And, uh, you know, and so we got to talking that summer, you know, how things go. And, and, uh, and, and at, by the end of the summer, I said, hey, this is something special. This is something that we want to pursue. But I also had a roommate with me in college, or, and uh, he went up with us in, in, in New York as well. And I remember him telling me on more than one occasion, he said, he said, John, he said, Arizona's a long ways away. <laughs> and, and it was true. From New York or from Florida, uh, Arizona was a long ways away. But sort of his assumption was, hey, man, don't get too invested in a relationship that's not going anywhere. That won't last for a long time. You're just going to be done with it in the summer. It's not a continual relationship. Well, I'm thankful to say it's been 13 years and he's been wrong up to this point. Yeah, sure, okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but this is the type of relationship, this is the type of love, this is the type of, of knowing that God's talking about in this passage. It's not just intellectual, it's experiential. And it's not for a limited time offer, it is continual. And it's love for you. See, John 10, 37 says, My sheep, this is Jesus speaking, says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. He said, I want to have a close relationship with you. Like a sheep knows his shepherd. And when the shepherd speaks, his sheep recognize his voice. And they follow and they know him. That's the type of intimate relationship that God wants with his children. And you can have it if you'll do it his way. So that's point number one is knowing God. 
Point number two is knowing God through Christ Jesus. And so we really see the how of this passage. So we say, okay, uh, God wants us to know him. He wants us to experience him. But So how do we go about doing that? Well, let's read verse 3 one more time. So this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So he talks about eternal life in this passage. So people have been uh, seeking to live forever as long as people have lived. They've looked for the fountain of youth and, and, uh, and, in, a, and a variety of other places. But what does the Bible mean when it says eternal life? Does it simply mean endless existence that you and I will just go on and on and on? We've all, or I wouldn't say that we've all, but most of us have seen the movie Groundhog's Day, right? And it's just a guy with the same, with a just endless existence. Every day, the premise of the movie is, is the guy who wakes up, and it's the same day, and it happens to be Groundhog's Day. And no matter what he does, he's practicing the piano, he's doing this, he's doing that, and, 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 all, and he's doing all these things, but it's still the same day. It's just endless, depressing existence. And is that what we have to look forward to as, as believers? It's just uh, endless existence, things exactly as they are now, uh, the same wars, uh, the same problems, the same challenges, the same people, just on and on and on. Is that what God promises? The answer is absolutely not. See, the Bible says that all people will exist somewhere. The question is, in what condition? For eternal life. The scripture says, eternal punishment. And this is important. I hope y'all are listening. So eternal life refers to a quality of life, not just a quantity of life. The Bible, when it talks about eternal life, eternal life is knowing and enjoying God for all eternity. And this is important. Um, John, uh, the Gospel of John, he, he mentions it at least 17 times in his passage or in, in, his, in his Gospel and several times in this passage. Uh, he wants people to know about the significance of eternal life. So eternal life is knowing and enjoying God for all eternity. The Bible says clearly we can only know God through faith in Christ Jesus. That is the only way. Now many people say, well, that's narrow. But truth is narrow sometimes. Now there's been a lot of flooding in uh, Tennessee. There's been a lot of, uh, of, of dangerous situations, flash flooding that people uh, weren't ready for. And so there's several people that had to be rescued by helicopters. And can you imagine people standing on their roofs, uh, watching their house slowly but surely uh, fall apart underneath their feet, knowing that their time is limited unless a rescuer comes, and then the uh, helicopter comes as it has come uh, for many of the people there. And, and, uh, and, and the helicopter said, hey, guy said, hey, why don't you hop in? And they say, no, 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 uh, I, I would really prefer a weatherman. And, and, I, and I would like him to just tell me, I would like to know how things are going to go for a while longer. Uh, I would like to know if, if, uh, if, you know, if the floods are going to cease, if the rain's going to keep going. And so we're just going to hang out here for a while longer. Or maybe the, uh, he, the rescuer reaches out his hand and they say, oh, you know, we're really, we're really in a lot of distress. Uh, look at this. I just saw my neighbor. There he goes. He's dying. Uh, there's his dog. And, uh, and so we're, 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 we're really concerned. And so could you just send uh, like a, a psychiatrist or a counselor, just have them sit alongside the roof with us and just help us through this hard time? Please, well, you laugh and chuckle because it's absolutely ridiculous. The rescuer is there, and there is only one uh, means of rescue for these people. And so it makes perfect and logical sense uh, to take uh, the hand of their rescuer. There's a lot of people challenges of, the, of this life and they're saying I, 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 I don't this, this, this Jesus, this God thing it just seems too narrow for me but if you need rescuing and there's only one rescuer it makes sense to take his hand you see heaven and eternal life are not a theme park and Jesus is simply the ticket the Bible says he is the main show. 
So we don't just say, God doesn't say, hey, well, you know, if, if, you, if you go through my way, if you go, uh, if you follow Christ, and then you get heaven and all the wonder that comes from it, uh, but you got to go through Jesus. No, the Bible says the reason why heaven is spectacular, why it's filled with joy, is because Jesus is there. And we get to know God in undiminished glory. He's the main attraction. The reason why heaven is heaven not because some of our loved ones will be there and that'll make heaven wonderful. Because there's not because there's no more pain, that'll be wonderful as well. But the Bible says heaven's heaven is because that's where God is at. That's where you get to experience experiencing him in all of his fullness and all of his glory. It says, This is eternal life that they may know the true God whom in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That Jesus was sent for a mission. That Jesus came for a reason. And the Bible says that is for the redemption, for the salvation of humanity. The Bible says that there is a real problem that all human hearts deal with. And friends, we don't have to look around long before we realize there's something not right in this world. The people don't treat each other right. There's, uh, there's, 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 there's heartache. There's brokenness in our own families, in our own lives. There's pain. There's sorrow, sickness, and disease. There's, there, there, there's something's not, not right here. We have to have laws to keep us from hurting one another. That's not the way that God designed it. We all have this gigantic problem called sin. And the Bible says every one of us, without exception, is a sinner that we stand guilty before a holy God. If we start looking through the Ten Commandments, we don't have to go far before we realize you know, that we stand guilty, that every one of us have sinned, not just in action, in our thoughts, and our motivations, our attitudes. All of those things are an offense to a holy God who is completely perfect, completely right, and completely just. And the same God who is our judge as well as our God he can't just sweep wrongdoing under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. He wouldn't be just or good or fair if he did that. So the same God who is just and our judge sent Jesus Christ. Sent Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he lived on this earth 33 years. Perfect. Never sinned one time and the sins problems that we have the selfishness the anger the pride the jealousy the lust the things that we wrestle with jesus never gave in to sin not one time the sin that infects us and infects our family and infects our world could not infect jesus matter of fact he brought healing everywhere that he went so we live his life completely perfect the same God, the same Jesus that was completely perfect, the Bible says he died on the cross for our sins. Not for his sin, mind you, for our sin. That the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus for your sin, for your wrongdoing, and for my wrongdoing. And Jesus came and he died in our place so that we don't have to be punished for our sins eternally because we've offended God. An eternal being. So Jesus died and he rose from the dead, conquering sin and conquering death. That's why Jesus came. That's why he was sent to redeem and save humanity. And so by only by placing our faith in him, what he's done, God says, I, I, I will allow his righteousness, his goodness to be counted towards you. When his righteousness, his goodness is given to us, then we can have relationship with God. Then we can know God. But it can only happen through the Son. It is only the Son. It is only Christ Jesus who can make you right with God. He is the only one that can forgive you of your sins. John 3.16 is a verse that many of us are familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Whosoever believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
See, friend, that's a promise, and it's a gift. It's not based on your character. It's not based on your conduct. The Bible says there's not enough, uh, there's not enough good that we could do that outweigh our bad. I don't know if you've seen the commercials or the, the State Farm ones right now, I think, and, and, uh, there's a, and it's Jake, the State Farm guy. And, uh, and so, uh, so it's with a lot of different people, whether they're celebrities, our regular people, and they're all trying to pay this guy back for the great deal that they got. Have y'all seen any of the commercials? Have y'all know what I'm talking about? And so they're all uh, so thankful that, that, they, that they all believe that, hey, this guy's giving me a special deal, that, th- that this gift is too good. Uh, that, that this can't be right. And so they're all trying to pay him back, uh, whether it be with, with honey or with pizza or whatever else is in the commercial. But this idea that, that, that he's given him something special. And Jake's response is always the same. Hey, man, I'm not giving you a special deal. It's just we have great rates. This is the way, this is the way we treat all people. But I want to tell you about a better deal. That's the deal that God gave you that gives humanity the Bible says that every one of us have sinned. Every one of us are, are, are guilty. So we cannot please God with our own righteousness. But God extends something called grace. Grace means undeserved, unmerited favor. He said, I love you so much that I, it doesn't matter where you're at or what you've done, that you can be forgiven of your sins, that you can be made right with the holy God. Not because you've done religious activity, you've done religious things, but because of God's grace, you can be made right with God. And that's the gift that he offers to all humanity. Now, not everybody's taken that gift. You look around our world and recognize that that's true. But God offers his free gift of salvation. And if you're willing to take it, he'll save your soul. So, friend, we can know God. We know God through Christ Jesus. He desires a relationship with you that's personal and real. And maybe you're a person who's dealt with a lot of religious activity, but you don't know the one true God. You don't know Christ Jesus. I hope this message hits you in your heart today, that you can know God.